Miglosh for the Wisconsin DMA and the International Society for Strategic Marketing. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about science and disconfirmation and how your presumptions can kill you. Stay tuned. Hang on. I think you're going to like it. Okay, first I want to talk about the scientific method. And you say, well, what do you know about the scientific method? You're a, you're a marketing guy. Well, my master's is in philosophy of science. And I wrote my thesis on David, Mir on David Hume's On Miracles, where he says that a miracle is a violation of natural law. A rational man proportions his belief to the evidence. And since we have overwhelming evidence for natural law, any violation of that should be disbelieved, even if you saw it yourself. Well, the problem is, let's say someone came from India and his belief, based on 100% of his experience, was that all water is liquid. Okay? In David Hume's time, let's say. And he gets to England and he looks out the window one day and the pond is frozen. He should disbelieve it, according to David Hume, because he has a massive disconfirmation where all the evidence weighs against him. And that's the trouble. The trouble is that if you, in philosophy we'd say a priori, or if your assumptions bias you against the data, then you can't benefit from the data. And actually, science is dead, because you close your eyes to the pond, and observation stops. And observation is the starting point. So without data, you have no observation. And with, that, with preconceived notions, you have no data. And you have no observations. Okay, so let's look at some things and see what we find. First off, I want to just turn the page. I ran across this fellow, James Todaro, <coughs> MD from Columbia Medical School. And he has put together some studies, and this was from today, I believe, or yesterday, where he said another antibody sh study showing COVID-19 infections drastically underestimated. <clears throat> this is an antibody study. Now, what an antibody study means is that rather than these preliminary tests, <clears throat> they're real tests with real blood and that sort of thing. And that's actually how we establish how many cases of the flu we have. We actually do it after the fact, and we can do it after the fact, long after the fact, because we have blood samples from all across the country uh, in all different places and ages and that sort of thing. And so we can establish a projection based on the sampling rate. Okay, And normally it's like 5 to 10 percent get the flu. Maybe 20 percent H1N1 I think was up to 20 percent because it was estimated at 60 million. Did we test 60 million? No. We estimated it and after the fact. Okay. And so what he's, what he's saying here is that if you compare by age the mortality rate based on a very high antibody level of about 5%, what you see is a comparable death rate to the flu in the Netherlands. Okay, We had a similar study, I believe this is from him, Today, <clears throat> Spain estimated about a 5% infection rate. Now, here's an interesting point. Those in quarantine trended toward a higher infection rate than those working. Okay? A higher infection rate also in those over 60. But a bigger factor was people in quarantine versus working. Right? So it challenges the idea that lockdowns protect the elderly or that quarantines protect anybody. Now, when we got started on this, we, we heard that it, it wasn't that serious, but in spite of that, we closed our flights to, to China, and everyone objected. They said, that's racist, we shouldn't do that. <laughs> you have to remember, who closed the, the flights to China it had never been hap happened before. But <clears throat> let's, let's, not, let's not bring in who did what here, right? There was also some treatments that were showing some promise, and those were embraced in some areas and discounted in others. Now, let's go, let's go on and see if we have another good graph. 
Okay. Governor Newsom's criteria to reopen counties in California are no more than one COVID-19 case per 10,000 and no COVID-19 deaths in the past 14 days. Now, you have to understand that COVID-19 deaths will happen potentially long term after the infection rate has gone down to nothing. So this means that essentially California can stay closed forever, according to that test. 95% of California fails the above. And just for reference, L.A. County has about 200 deaths every 14 days or 100 deaths uh, a week. So, but this is 14 days from flu and pneumonia on average through the year. We don't shut down. So, we have some really interesting perspectives on data. Now, I just wanted to visit for a second here, not long. I just wanted to visit hydrochloroquine because I am curious about it. It's low cost. Um, oftentimes, you can get it if you're going to a malaria country, you just get it. The doctor says, go get some. And the Z pack is widely used too. Very inexpensive, very widely used. And, but after it was mentioned by a certain political figure, all kinds of news came out against it. Now, this is in spite of the fact that Dr. Fauci had recommended it in 2005 for antiviral for flu treatment, right? Okay. So interesting, interesting combination. And you may not believe the data I'm going to give you. That's okay. I just want you to be open to data. And we'll explain it in a minute. Okay, so here is, here is basically positive hydrochloroquine tests and on both effectiveness and lack of harm. Okay, and here we go. We'll just go, we'll just go a bit. This doctor from Columbia has compiled this. And each study is only about a paragraph. So there's about five studies. And it's 26 pages. Okay. And you can look them all up. I can send you that link. Happy to. Uh, just write me. But it is not, um, we're not claiming this is health information. I'm not claiming you should take it. You make your own decisions. I run my medical data past a surgeon. Okay. Lifetime surgeon who has some very interesting skepticism about medical data in general. He told me they had a consultant come in from the hospital saying they could add, you know, because certain things happen during surgery, you could change some numbers a little bit and the hospital would make more money. But then there's a grading consulting firm that comes in and evaluates surgeons. And because they had more conditions all of a sudden, their surgical team was downgraded. And then the consulting firm offered to help them get their scores back up. Uh, it just shows you there's some bias in this sort of thing, right? So, uh, let's also, oh, we also saw that there's the Spain one, Spain study. There's the Netherlands study. Okay, so now let's go to, the, the real question for me is, will you die? So, Tesla's reopening its factory. And um, California, apparently, or his county said, it's okay with us. You can open your county. So that's good news for Tesla. Uh, it's good news that he had the courage to do that. Okay. But so far, we've seen data that suggests that the, the lockdown is not effective. Okay. There's also an interesting, there's an interesting point made down in the bottom of this. This is USA Today. Oops, that's in the next article. Okay, in the next article. Uh, Wisconsin Supreme Court struck down the stay-at-home order mainly because we had no public input, we had no legislative uh, confirmation, and so some health official made the, all the rules by herself. And the Supreme Court said, you can't just make all the rules yourself. You can't just violate all the rights and have no counter-arguments. The idea of government limiting itself is almost... A, a, a silly notion, right? But the idea of different branches of government competing for power 
is a wonderful idea. It's the best idea ever. And that's why it works. Because the government won't limit itself. It'll always take power. But other branches, in this case, the Supreme Court, but in another case, it would be the legislature, if they tried to pass these rules, struck it all down. So anyway, very interesting. And local officials may make their own rules. This one was funny. Talking indoors could lead to coronavirus transmission, study says. <laughs> okay, so National Academy of Sciences of the United States of America said that when you talk aloud, you can have more transmission indoors. So if you live in an Italian family, and remember, Italy had a high transmission rate, and then they locked them all down, and it maybe didn't help, but now that the now the data is supporting the, well, they claim it's supporting the lockdown, but it's stopping anyway. It's stopping in every country, basically all over the world, because that's what happens with flu. Whether you do something about it or don't, it peters out. Because most my mutations, if there are mutations, are harmful to the, to the, to the bug, and it gets weaker. Okay, okay so, um, so those are interesting facts. So, and, and so we're still going to ask the question, will you die? Now, there's, there's a, a few other, oops, I had some other, oh, I skipped these. We'll go over here. It's very, very confusing, and I admit that it is. We'll go back here. Okay, it turns out that if you are in, um, oh, okay, we're going to go, there's Governor Newsom, okay. It turns out that most of the deaths are in nursing homes, and in New York, and in in New York, they actually sent people to the nursing homes who were sick. And in Pennsylvania, they had the same rule, and the person who made the rule, it turns out, moved her mother out of the nursing home before the rule took effect, which is big news. You may not have heard that, but it seems to be true. I don't know. I saw an interview why she was explaining why she did it. So in Pennsylvania, 70% of the deaths are nursing homes. In, in uh, Minnesota, Almost 85% of the deaths are in nursing homes. And the country is basically about 50%. Okay, so it's fairly isolated. More than you might have thought, right? And we already found that staying home might not be the answer. Okay, here's an example of mid-March, the reporting, where the infection rate and the, and the death rate or whatever, I don't know, they took two different numbers. They compared the flu over here with COVID-19, 14%. Okay, and here is the same data, basically, if you were comparing apples to apples, which is an important thing. I wrote an article, which again, I'll send you if you ask, which was called Integrity as a Modeling Variable. And the reason is because if you start kidding yourself, if you start cutting corners, you start missing things. You start missing things. It's scary. So the press was taking liberties with the data and comparing apples to oranges and saying, this is way more serious. This is way more serious, right? Way more serious. But it turns out when you compare the antibody studies, that it's not. Spain and the Netherlands and USC and Stanford said that the infection rate was just under 5% in, in uh, L.A. County, and the, but that made the, the likelihood of dying way lower than they had been projected. See, they were comparing, they were comparing the, the known cases, and they were only testing people with symptoms. And 80 to 90 percent of the people who get it don't have any symptoms. That's why you do the antibody tests after the fact. Okay? But they were comparing the known cases against the known deaths rather than the total cases against the known deaths, a much bigger number. You see how much more scary that makes it. You know, and, and I highly recommend How to Lie with Statistics, which is available as a PDF. You can get that from me, too. I send it to all my kids. Okay, so boil it all down. It turns out that the red states, red states being, um, did I graph this backwards? I graphed it backwards. <laughs> the red states, these are the red states. <laughs> have about one-third the deaths per million than the blue states. Why? Hmm, I don't know. I've been told uh, in the New York studies of hydrochloroquine, they only gave it to people who were already in a hospital and maybe on ventilators. It doesn't work. It has to prevent that. That's what it does. 
what it does is it interferes with the virus's ability to dislodge the iron from your hemoglobin. And again, good article on that. Um, and that's why a that's why a malaria drug actually happens to be happens to be effective, right? The the Z pack prevents the infection in the lungs, and the uh, and the hydrochloroquine prevents the release of free iron ions from the hemoglobin, which are how the oxygen attaches to a hemoglobin. So your blood stops transporting oxygen, and then the, the iron goes and attacks the lungs, which have a funny immune system. So, well, I have another graph. Let's go to the next graph. This is, this is a short-term time frame, but this one actually has the blue states higher, which is the way I should have done it, and the red states lower, right? Okay. So, back to the scientific method. Let's just compare some states. Let's see if that makes any sense. And I'm just going to look at total deaths. So we'll go over here to full screen. And uh, again, this is a little hard to do. But if you compare New York, New Jersey, Illinois, Massachusetts, California, Pennsylvania, Michigan, those are all states that are basically blue states, right? Perennially, right? Okay, so the top six, seven states are blue of all the deaths. And the vast majority of deaths are in those states. Now, Florida has about the same per population as New York, but it only has 1,800 deaths and New York has 27,000. Okay, so more than 10 times. Texas actually has 10 million more people than Florida or New York, but it only has 1,100 de deaths, 1,200 if you round it up. Okay, so I wanted to put that in perspective. It that it's probably true that numbers per thousand, you can verify it right here. This is CDC numbers. And uh, then, so then I thought to myself, well, how's New York doing? In spite of all these deaths, because this is like new deaths here. Scroll up. Infected, new infections. So there aren't even new infections over there. So hallelujah. Okay, and here is the, the graphs. Oops. Graphs. We got some good graphs here. Good graphs. Okay, so this is the trending in the United States of America. And you can see, whoo-hoo, total infections. That's infections. That's not deaths. Remember I told you the deaths will lag? Let's take out the infections. This is great graphics. Look at that. Even the deaths are going down, way down. Okay, so don't worry too much. You say, well, but if we all get out to work, it'll go up again. Not necessarily. I'm at work. I've been working the whole time. What I didn't realize until the Wisconsin Supreme Court ruling yesterday was that I could have been fined 250 bucks and a month up to a month in jail for riding my scooter to work talking to nobody nobody at all in my office whereas my son is in a critical job and so he goes to work and talks with the people and hangs around I don't know what he does right but he's bringing it home eh, we're still okay Okay, just wanted to show you the U.S. You say, well, what about New York? How's it doing? Well, here's New York, and here's the infections. Pshhh, down, and here is the deaths. Even that's down. They can't find enough people dying to make their claim. And so you say, well, what about like South Dakota? I've heard South Dakota's got a lot of problems. Well, it's kind of flat. I got to admit, they got a big bump right here. But if you average it, it looks like it's going down. And uh, if we take that out, deaths, but that's a five, five. This is a three and a half. How they get three and a half deaths in a day, I don't know. But you look at the projections down here, and the projections are downhill, even so. Okay, And this is based on county by county through the country on their mitigation methods. Now let's look at uh, the changes. Because you say, well, what about, what if, let's see if we can make that a little bigger, a little bigger. What, here, high-risk states are seeing fewer new corona cases. High-risk states, meaning the states that aren't mitigating much at all. South Dakota didn't. Now, South Dakota is brown on this map because their cases went up briefly. And, and this is through May 11th, so it's not as current as the data I just showed you where it you know, is, looks like it's still going down. And it's projected to go down. But Florida, minus 14%. Georgia, minus 12%, in spite of the fact that they opened it up. Okay, I've heard Texas is open. They're up a little, but not much. In new cases, not deaths. You know, you can mitigate the deaths. I mean, there's several treatments. One is worth trying before you get in the hospital is the hydrochloroquine. I've heard anecdotally that a person in, in Freighter, our main teaching hospital, was, you know, 
almost, you know, seemed like a miraculous turnaround. You get those stories from around the country. Um, you, I heard, um, but I did hear that a pharmacist in, in, I believe it was Texas, wouldn't fill a prescription and unless there was a diagnosis given with it. And the doctor said, okay, heart disease <laughs> or something, diabetes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, because there are states that are limiting this. And New York studies, and that's in this big, long report I showed you, New York studies are only after they're on ventilators when it's too late, probably too late to have any effect whatsoever. After that, there's um, colloidal steroids. University of Wisconsin came out with that a couple of weeks ago. That 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 is, is very effective in limiting in inflammation in the lungs. And so they're having really great luck in treating that. But like I said, you can find study after study after study. So I think we're in good shape as far as you don't have to die. And so now let's go back to think about the scientific method. Why does this matter? So I worked with a company that sold pet grooming. And we found that pet groomers were in high income areas. If you think best of show, John Candy uh, movie about dog grooming. Um, you know, it's kind of an upscale world. Not really. I mean, you don't have to be, but it's kind of, you know, you're get, spending 60 bucks a month on your foo foo poodle hairdo. So you got to have a little bit of extra income, whether you make a lot or not, you devote a lot of it to this. So our first model looked like that. Our second model, uh, they said, gee, you made us so much more money. I think we made, uh, 250,000 in profit and they made 180,000. And the president said, do you do this often? Uh, and I started to say no. And then it turns out, yeah, we kind of do. Um, we've changed valuations of companies so dramatically that about 15 companies that I worked for over the years, um, sold out really close after that or grew so dramatically and then didn't grow after I was not around. I, I'm a disruptor because I even hold my own biases as lightly as possible, which makes me a little crazy, I admit. But it can also make you money. So 15 companies, valuation improved enough that they sold, right? So here's this pet grooming company. So in the spring, you know, we had had this high income, we called it Fifi the Poodle model, where it skewed toward high income, high density, high uh, education rate, high dwelling value, all of those things. In the spring, it was low, all of those things. Low density, low dwelling value, low education, low, um, low income. I thought the computer was broken. I always assume that we should question our data, that we should question our assumptions. We couldn't find anything wrong. It seemed to really be crazy. And this is a B2B. This is a B2B company. Well, I was about ready to call the client and say, we, we found this weird stuff, but we can't explain it. But instead, I thought, you know, I know somebody that's out in the country, has a couple of dogs. Let me call him. So I called Johnny out in the, out in the woods. <laughs> Johnny has hunting dogs. And I said, hey, Johnny, do you ever get your dogs groomed? And he said, no. Then he said, what do you mean groomed? And I said, you know, doggy haircut. Oh, yeah, sure. So right away I was suspicious, right? Right away there was something fishy going on. I said, well, when do you do it? Why do you do it? He said, well, you know, usually in the spring, the dog's full of burrs. Weather's getting a little warmer. Dog seems to like it. Do you care what the dog looks like? No. Where do you get it done? Oh, the vet or the boarding kennel or sometimes a pet store. And so it turned out that there was this dog clipper market where dogs got clipped, you know, for the spring. And it turned out that most pet owners, where the weather changed a lot, would go get those. So the dog, or the dogs rather, so the dog market for clipping was maybe 20, 30 times bigger than the dog groomers. And it was in the data. They were selling clippers and shampoo and stuff to these non-dog grooming stores. 
but it was a complete flip, geodemographically, a complete 180 degree flip. Now, this is, was in the 2001 recession. Um, most companies were shrinking. This company, it actually shrunk over time. <laughs> shrunk over time, right? And I think it was actually the name of the company was called New England Serum because that's what they had started in and they'd been shrinking for years. And when they got me in, all of a sudden we found more mailable names. And I flew out there and I talked to them about it. And they said, you know, we have better buying power than Pet Edge. That's just a franchise, you know, uh, it has a big name. I mean, then PetMart, PetSmart, one of the two. They changed their name to Pet Edge. They grew 20% that year. Remember, they hadn't been growing and it was a recession. Then they grew 20% the next year and 20% the next year. Then they fired me, as usual. And then they stopped growing. But, and they hired me again a couple of years later. So, you know, um, it should have kept me around. So ignoring data, we could have just ruled out the data. We should, that's outliers. That's something. We're, we're just not going to do it. We're going to run the same model we did a few months ago. And, but instead, we grew them. And we've grown. We grew Baseball Express with weird anomalies. I said to them, hey, do you ever sell, do you ever think of yourself as selling to businesses? They said, no, we're strictly consumer. I said, strictly consumer? Who buys these pitching machines for $4,000? They said, oh, leagues and schools, colleges, even major league teams. I said, did you ever consider those to be businesses? No. We're strictly consumer, they said. So we did an analysis of people that bought those pitching machines and what else did they buy. And one of the things was line chalk and rosin bags, which are very inexpensive. But some people bought rosin bags and line chalk without buying the pitching machine. And so we said, you know, why don't you call these people that are buying line chalk? Why? Because line chalk, I mean, we played a lot of baseball growing up, but we never lined our field. <laughs> if you're lining your field, you have a serious baseball diamond. And you're more like a business than you are like a backyard ball game. Got it? Okay, so that one idea, I think, pretty close to doubled them from 5 million in sales to 10. When we started, they were 5 million in sales. We went through five ownership changes because we kept growing them, or they kept growing them. I mean, they did stuff, we did stuff, we worked together, but they went from 5 million to 50 million in 10 years. That's pretty good, I'd say, right? And, uh, five ownership changes, and they told people that we were working with them, that that was one of the big benefits that they had, that they had a, they had a database company, a modeling company doing machine learning. And let me tell you this, if you say that, I mean, I worked against Toys R Us, but they, they raised a lot of money saying that they were going to do database and machine learning and targeted marketing and all that stuff, the same stuff everybody's saying today, but they didn't know how to do it. And they lied to their investors. And I'm not going to tell you the whole story. But I can tell you that if you are concerned about your valuation, then getting somebody in who knows how to grow companies can change it right now. So, don't ignore data. It can kill you. It can also kill your company. Work with somebody who knows how to turn money into data, who knows how to increase the valuation of your company, who can grow you in the worst economic times, because I've done it with many, many people. I'm John Miglosh. Have a great day. Like and share. I hope you enjoyed this mini webinar. Bye-bye.